This is Dr. Hessel uh, recording the podcast, the first of two on the physics of the anesthesia machine. Uh, This is an outline of uh, some of the material that I will cover. Uh, This is more extensive than I'm going to discuss in this PowerPoint, in this podcast. I've underlined the topics uh, that will be covered in the podcast. The other topics will be covered in the uh, complete PowerPoint, which is posted on Wiki. These are uh, the reading assignments that you were provided. In addition, I recommend uh, this sort of Bible of anesthesia equipment by Dorsch and Dorsch. Uh, this uh, excellent uh, text from the group at MGH and uh, two other uh, books that I have used as uh, references. The uh, MGH textbook is particularly uh, informative, and uh, these particular chapters, I think, are most relevant to our topic. So the first topic is uh, resistance and types of flow. Um, Resistance to the flow of gases is manifested by a slight pressure drop. Um, uh, This pressure drop is to overcome resistance. Uh, resistance is influenced by the flow rate and by the type of flow and it's uh, typically expressed as pressure drop per flow rate usually centimeters of water per liter per second Uh, this is a illustration of uh, how there is a pressure drop across an area of resistance Uh, flows are uh, categorized as laminar or turbulent Uh, Laminar flow is smooth and orderly. The particles all move in a line uh, with the fastest flow in the center and the slowest flow along the walls. Uh, Most importantly, uh, the Hagen-Poiseuille law applies uh, to the pressure drop, which is governed by the length of viscosity, flow rate, and uh, radius to the fourth power, inversely to the radius of the fourth power. This is a schematic showing the type of flow in a tube, uh, which is laminar. And as we indicated, uh, the flow is uh, regulated by the change in pressure divided by the resistance in the tube. Uh, And uh, there is a direct uh, linear relationship between pressure and flow. Turbulent flow, on the other hand, is disorderly. Uh, The flow lines are not parallel. The particles move in all directions, including sideways and even opposite to the main flow rate direction. Uh, And uh, flow is equal across the entire diameter of the tube. Uh, The Hagen-Poiseuille law does not apply, and the pressure drop is influenced by density and inversely to the fifth power of the radius. Thus the use of helium, which has similar viscosity but lower density, uh, is uh, preferred for relieving resistance due to turbulent flow. Uh, Again, this diagram compares the nature of laminar flow with turbulent flow as does this diagram. Um, For turbulent flow, uh, the uh, flow rate is proportional to the square root of pressure, and hence the pressure gradient increases uh, as the square of the flow. And that is illustrated by this diagram here. Unlike linear uh, laminar flow, where it's linear. Turbulent flow can be generalized where it occurs uh, uh, throughout a tube or localized uh, when it occurs in areas of restriction or curves or bends. Uh, Turbulent flow, generalized turbulent flow is, uh, is detected by the Reynolds number which we will discuss shortly. 
these are some of the localized uh, areas where you generate turbulent flow. Uh, laminar flow becomes turbulent at sharp changes in tube diameter. For generalized flow, um, um, it can be uh, described uh, by the Reynolds number. Um, and uh, when the number is less than 2,000, the flow is predominantly laminar. And when it is greater than 4,000, flow, uh, turbulent flow dominates. And between 2,000 and 4,000, the flow is transitional. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the Reynolds number is related to the uh, radius of the tube, the velocity, the density, and the viscosity. Gas uh, resistance is unique uh, when uh, fluids, either a gas or a liquid, flows through an orifice. And the flow rate through an orifice is uh, uh, proportional to the diameter squared uh, and uh, uh, the density of the fluid. Resistance uh, is reflected in uh, flow volume loops. And uh, uh, when using uh, a ventilator, uh, one can compare the difference between peak pressure and plateau pressure to detect resistance. Uh, this diagram shows the uh, pressure pattern uh, uh, when you are using a volume ventilator uh, with a period of inspiratory pause. Uh, the pressure, the peak pressure reflects both the uh, compliance of the lungs and chest wall as well as the resistance in the airway. Uh, during uh, the plateau phase, there is no flow, and so resistance falls out of the equation. The difference between peak and plateau, therefore, uh, reflects resistance. And normally, this is about 2 to 5 centimeters of water pressure. Uh, flow volume loops are used uh, to reflect uh, resistance. Well, uh, pressure volume loops uh, reflect compliance. Now, what are some of the sources of resistance and turbulent flow in anesthetic circuits? Um, uh, the circle system itself uh, is no longer thought to cause uh, significant resistance. Uh, furthermore, the large corrugated circuit tubing is also uh, unlikely to cause resistance. However, heat and moisture exchangers uh, can cause uh, increased resistance uh, if uh, they uh, collect a lot of water or uh, if they uh, uh, become uh, saturated with uh, secretions. Uh, for this reason, they are not recommended for spontaneous breathing, especially in children. The endotracheal tube is thought to be the most important site of resistance in anesthesia circuits. Uh, there is a lack of agreement as to what size endotracheal tube uh, produces significant resistance. Uh, uh, I think that in general, uh, for adults, uh, the resistance of a uh, spontaneously breathing, quietly breathing patient uh, is probably not uh, significant with tubes of uh, over seven millimeters in diameter. So what can we do to minimize resistance in the circuit? 
um, we can minimize the length, uh, maximize the diameter, and avoid sharp curves or sudden changes in diameter. And uh, beware of filters and HMEs. Another a topic of relevance is the issue of rebreathing in dead space. By rebreathing, we mean to inhale previously respired gases. They may or may not include uh, carbon dioxide. The amount of rebreathing is influenced by the type of circuit and the functional capacity, function of the various components, uh, the fresh gas flow and the dead space uh, in the system. Dead space is divided into mechanical dead space, which is within the breathing circuit, and the physiologic dead space. Uh, this includes the so-called anatomic dead space, uh, which uh, involves the conducting airways, uh, and uh, the alveolar dead space, which are alveoli that are ventilated but not perfused. The latter is influenced by position uh, 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 and uh, 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 pulmonary blood flow, uh, pulmonary pressure, vascular occlusion such as uh, uh, due to bronchoconstriction or, or emboli. Um, the total uh, physiologic dead space is estimated about 2 milliliters per kilo, or about 150 milliliters in an average 70 kilogram uh, person. Uh, the uh, dead space in the uh, breathing circuit is uh, uh, limited to that beyond the uh, Y piece. What is rebreathed uh, depends on the origin of the gas in the dead space. If it's from the anatomic dead space, uh, the inspired gases are fully saturated with water and at body temperature. If it's from the alveoli, there is less oxygen and less anesthetic agent, but more carbon dioxide, and uh, at body temperature is usually fully saturated. The consequences of rebreathing is that you conserve heat and moisture, um, you decrease oxygen and anesthetic agent concentration, and it may increase uh, CO2 uh, levels if it's not being scavenged by a CO2 absorber. Let's then turn to the topic of humidity. Uh, the amount of humidity is the amount of water vapor in a gas. It can be expressed as the absolute humidity, which is the mass per volume, milligrams of water per liter, or relative, which is the amount of water uh, versus the capacity when fully saturated at a given temperature. By saturation, we mean uh, that uh, the gas is holding as much water as it can, and it varies uh, with temperature. At 22 degrees, it can hold about 19 milligrams per liter, and at 37 degrees, about 44 milliliters per liter. The partial pressure of the water vapor at these two temperatures is 20 and 47 millimeters of mercury, respectively. Medical gases are supplied as dry at room temperature. By the time they are delivered to the alveolus, they are fully saturated with water and warm to body temperature. Normally, when we breathe, the nose is the principal heat and moisture exchanger. And by the time the inspired gas gets to the trachea, it's already about 30 to 32 degrees temperature and about 89% saturated. Of course, endotracheal tubes and supraglottic airways bypass this natural humidification system. There are potential adverse consequences of inhaling dry air. 
the importance of which is uncertain. It's probably of more importance in pediatrics during long procedures and in patients at increased risk for pulmonary complications. Potential adverse effects are damage to the respiratory tract, heat loss, fluid loss, and endotracheal tube uh, obstruction. Um, the amount of heat loss is relatively small, uh, about a tenth of a degree per hour in an adult, and the fluid loss is also uh, relatively small, only about 30 cc's uh, per hour in an adult. Uh, of greater potential complication is that inhaling dry gases may damage the respiratory tract, uh, causing thickening of secretions, decreased capillary function, impaired surfactant activity, etc. For this reason, I advocate using a heat and moisture exchange device on all cases, although there is little uh, high-level evidence showing that this improves outcome in uh, during anesthesia, although there is good evidence showing that in the ICU, when patients are on ventilators for uh, 24 or more hours, that humidification does reduce pulmonary complications. Now, uh, how do we get uh, humidity into anesthesia circuits? Uh, one source is the carbon dioxide absorbent. This contains water, and water and heat are produced as it absorbs and reacts with carbon dioxide. Exhaled gases, of course, uh, uh, contain uh, warm, uh, humidified uh, 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 gases. Uh, this is favored by low fresh gas flow. Uh, uh, by moisturizing the breathing tubes in the reservoir bag, uh, by use of coaxial tubings and heat and moisture exchangers, uh, humidifiers, and, uh, of course, the circle system. Uh, heat and moisture exchangers, uh, abbreviated HME, uh, also known as artificial noses or passive or regenerative humidifiers. There are uh, two main varieties. One is hydrophobic, uh, of which a humid event is an example and the other are hygroscopic. The advantages of them, of these are that they are cheap, easy, and effective. Uh, they are also uh, effective bacterial and viral filters, and they uh, avoid the risk of overheating or excess humidification. Uh, this compares the hygroscopic with the hydrophobic uh, type of HMEs. This is simply an example of uh, uh, the effectiveness of these HMEs. Uh, some of the limitations are that uh, the amount of temperature preservation uh, is limited. Uh, they have limited humidification characteristics. They do increase the dead space and uh, the resistance. Uh, there is risk of disconnect. Uh, it may have adverse effects on uh, carbon dioxide absorbers. They can become obstructed with uh, secretions in blood, and they may lose their filtering capacity. Uh, other devices uh, to warm and humidify the breathing gases are humidifiers. Uh, these can be unheated uh, or heated. Uh, the advantage is that they provide more effective humidification, but the disadvantages are their complexity, uh, maintenance, uh, little benefit in terms of heat loss, and potential complications. So that although they were commonly used about 10 to 15 years ago in the anesthesia circuits, they are rarely used uh, anymore in anesthesia, but they are usually present in ICU ventilators. This expands on some of the potential complications of uh, heated humidifiers. 
Uh, other sources of humidity is a circle system, and the amount of humidity gradually increases over time. Uh, the sources of this humidity are the exhaled gases, the absorbent, and water for neutralization of carbon dioxide. After about 60 minutes at fresh gas flow of under 2 liters, the humidity is up to about 20 to 25 milligrams per liter. Let's then turn to the topic of heat, heat loss, and heat maintenance. And uh, I would urge you uh, to review the outstanding chapter in uh, the latest edition of Miller's written by Dr. Sessler who is uh, world's authority on this matter. Hypothermia was found to be very common after anesthesia, whether it be regional or general, uh, if you do nothing about it. Um, furthermore, it's now known, uh, or, or excuse me, the causes of this hypothermia is a widening of the set point of the hypothalamus and uh, reduced response and effectiveness uh, to uh, hypothermia. Uh, the usual course uh, is during the first hour, the temperature declines at between a half and one and a half degrees. Um, interestingly, two thirds of this is due to redistribution from the core to the periphery due to vasodilation and loss of defense mechanisms and not due to loss of heat from the body. Over the next few hours, there is a progressive but slower fall in temperature, and this is due to heat loss. Eventually, it levels off where heat loss is balanced by heat production. Heat loss itself uh, mainly occurs from the skin, and it is proportional to the temperature difference between the patient and their environment, uh, and uh, the amount of sk exposed uh, surface. Uh, it's a more serious problem in uh, pediatrics because of their greater body surface area to weight. The corollary is uh, keeping the patient covered and keeping the warm room temperature high will minimize heat loss during anesthesia. But unfortunately, uh, sufficient temperature to avoid hypothermia is uncomfortable for the working staff and is therefore rarely used. There are uh, at least four main mechanisms of heat loss during anesthesia. Uh, besides the redistribution, which we talked about earlier. Radiation accounts for about uh, two-thirds of the heat loss during anesthesia, and it's caused by uh, electromagnetic energy being transferred to the colder objects in the environment, but not in contact with the patient. Uh, it's affected by the temperature of the objects in the environment, uh, and it's not affected uh, by air temperature, air movement, or distance of the object from the patient. Convection refers to transfer of heat to air current. It is influenced by air temperature and the amount of airflow, and it can be reduced by covering the patient with surgical drapes. Uh, the radiation, on the other hand, uh, can also be uh, reduced by covering them with uh, 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 metallic uh, covers which uh, block out uh, uh, infrared rays. Conduction refers to transfer by direct contact to colder objects. It is proportional to the temperature difference and influenced by the conductivity of the object. It's also increased by wetness. Uh, closed cold prep solutions and irrigation solutions are uh, examples of sources of conduction loss, as is lying on a cold operating room table. Finally, uh, evaporation 
is uh, heat loss due to heat of vaporization. Remember, you lose about 500 calories for every milliliter of water that evaporates. Uh, this comes from the skin, uh, the respiratory tract, open wounds, and exposed body cavities. Other factors that influence the rate of heat loss include uh, duration of exposure and surgery, the site of the surgery, IV fluids, and is aggravated in people at extremes of age, cachectic patients, women, and patients with low BMI. What are the consequences of this modest hypothermia? One is shivering and thermal discomfort. Another is abnormal metabolism of drugs. And the third is a leftward shift of oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve and lactic acidosis. It also is known to increase the length of stay in the PACU and to be associated with cardiovascular complications, likely due to catecholamine and sympathetic activation, including increased cardiac work, myocardial ischemia and infarction, arrhythmias, and cardiac arrest. It's also associated with increased risk of bleeding, increased infection, and increased cost. Uh, it can interfere with monitoring if the patient is shivering, or, and it can interfere with venous cannulation if the patient is vasoconstricted. So what can be done to minimize this heat loss? And uh, what is common at the moment is uh, forced air warming devices such as the bear hugger. Uh, there are also new devices like the air-free conductive fabric warming blanket, uh, currently commercially sold as, quote, hot dog. There are also liquid circulating devices. Um, the old style were uh, corrugated rubber mats, which fluid uh, uh, pass through. Uh, the newer ones are thin pads, pads which uh, adhere to the skin and carry the trade name Arctic Sun. Um, it has turned out that lying on liquid circulating devices uh, does not, uh, uh, is not very effective because of vasoconstriction of uh, the skin and thus very little heat transfer. There are also electric warming blankets, passive covering, radiant heaters, heating and humidifying inspired gases, use of heat and moisture exchangers. Uh, I mentioned a, a new device that is being uh, uh, popularized by uh, the company known as a hot dog and I've given you a, a site that you can go to. Um, there is recently been some concern that uh, the uh, forced air uh, warming devices may increase the risk of infection and uh, uh, one of the points that this company is pushing is that it eliminates that, that risk. Uh, I'm not uh, thoroughly familiar with the data that, that supports these contentions. This is an example from their advertisements of the hot dog devices. Other strategies include use of low gas flow, uh, use of fluid warmers, uh, uh, hot water uh, uh, containers, although uh, we used to put uh, bags from uh, fluid bags from the fluid warmers on the patients, but uh, this is uh, uh, no longer permitted because of uh, reports of uh, burning patients. Uh, increasing the temperature of the room, we've mentioned. Uh, there are esophageal warming devices. There are endovascular warming devices, which are used uh, in our critical care units. And finally, you can lavage. Uh, the body cavities with warm fluids. This uh, completes the uh, first uh, uh, podcast on this uh, topic.